Okay, Keith, where's Keith? There you are. Now, Keith was wearing short pants before and wouldn't talk in short pants. I thought it'd be nice for him to talk in short pants, but he went back to his, uh, his hotel room and changed into long pants. I don't know why Keith did that. He has rather attractive knees and shanks, <laughs> but he did. Oh, Keith Bellows. Thank you, Richard. <laughs> Richard tells you to do two things. Speak about what you're passionate about and tell stories. We're gonna to try to do both. But before I do that, I wanna ask you a simple question. How many people here, here have been to Venice? Hands up, a lot. For those of you who, who uh, haven't been to Venice, you better get there fast because there's a very good chance in the next 10 or 20 years that ain't gonna be there. Um, and I want you to hold that thought for a moment because what we'll talk about is my passion, which is travel. And um, it may surprise you to know Travel is the number one industry in the world. It's bigger than technology. It's bigger than entertainment. It's bigger than design. It's bigger than the healthcare industry. $30.8 trillion, one in seven people in the world, is employed in the travel industry. That's my passion. Um, and I'm going to show you a little fanciful exercise here. And then I'm going to try to pull a, a bunch of disparate ideas together. Um, but first, uh, let's go to dark here and watch um, the first half of a two-part film. Roll it, if you can. How do you define traveling? By where you go? by how you get there, or by what you learn. How do you know how far someone has traveled, or from where? He first read about Machu Picchu in National Geographic Traveler's 50 Places of a Lifetime special issue in 1999. The traveler was fascinated by this ancient Inca city in the clouds. Abandoned around 500 years ago, it disappeared into the jungle and into the mists of time for centuries. Where did they go? Then in 1911, it was rediscovered by the young archaeologist Hiram Bingham. His time at Machu Picchu is well documented. Looking through the scrapbooks of Bingham's expeditions, is there something in those old pictures that is vaguely familiar? Only time will tell. After Bingham's discovery, Machu Picchu became a legendary travel destination. Across the years, thousands made the trek to its ruins. When the traveler went there in 2000, he was awed by the sight. Wandering around the deserted Inca city high in the mountains of Peru, he felt its timeless magic. Over time, Machu Picchu's popularity grew. As travel exploded in the early 21st century, more and more people visited the site. Soon there were more hotels and more people, an overhead tram and more people, an observation tower and stores and more people. In 2011, exactly 100 years after Bingham rediscovered the lost city, it was declared an endangered site by the World Monument Fund and closed to tourism. Like so many places, its very popularity became its biggest threat. The tourists who had made it so were now denied visits altogether. 
Machu Picchu was again a deserted city in the mountains, visited only by condors. That for a sec. Um, so what's the point? The point is that the places that we love the most are getting loved to death. Um, the U.S. population alone is growing 2.5 million people a year. That's about a, that's a little Christmas present of a little mid-sized city every single year. Um, consider that just after World War II, only one million people in the world left home for a pleasure trip to another country. Italy today gets one million visitors, foreign visitors, a week. Um, you cannot even get close to the Mona Lisa. We all know that. This is um, not something that is a problem today that we can solve. But if we don't start solving it, we're going to have a bigger problem. Because consider a couple of things that are almost inevitable. Americans today have 13, and I, Canadians are a little luckier, but Americans have 13 leisure days a year. Canadians have 26. Italians have 49. The baby boom's getting older. And inevitably, what's going to happen is they're going to have more leisure time and more disposable income. A lot of these baby boomers are going to come in to between 60 and $80 billion of extra disposable income just because of um, their parents dying. Um, but what is much more scary is that the travel industry became the number one industry in the world based essentially on the travel patterns of six or seven countries. That's going to change dramatically, and the biggest change is this. Consider what happens five years, 10 years, 15 years, when the Chinese start to travel. Consider what the Ontario Science Center is going to look like, the Royal Ontario Museum, some of the parks, the national parks, Algonquin, Quetico, all of these parks. You ain't seen nothing yet. Something has to give. We just can't continue to, uh, to, to, to travel like this. I'm not very good with numbers, so I'm going to read a few more. In 1988, 2.3 million people visited the Vatican Museums. Ten years later, it was 3.3 million. The Alaska cruise ship uh, tourist industry put quadrupled in a decade. It put 600,000 people last year into, into Alaska. Consider that there's only 30,000 people who live in Jesus. By 2015, it's going to double. So my point is we've got to find some alternatives. One may be that family will go to the local travel area. Little Johnny will run off to the beach. Susie will visit Paris. Parents will visit Tahiti all virtually. Because a lot of the places that you want to go to won't be available to go to. But perhaps there's another alternative. Perhaps there's something that we haven't thought about. And I want to share that with you. I'm going to roll the film again. Machu Picchu would not vanish for long from the minds of men. Quite the contrary. It was in the mind of man that it took on new life. After the discovery of Timentia in 2040, time travel became a reality. For so many centuries, we had assumed that time travel would involve sending the body through time and space using strange and wondrous machines. But the speed of light proved to be an impenetrable barrier until a visionary Peruvian scientist proved in theory and later in deed that to travel in time, you needed only to send the mind. Timentia, a unique and rare substance, proved to be the key. The consciousness knew no limits of speed and required no machine to move it. And with Timentia, where the mind went, 
the body would follow. The National Geographic Society pioneered time expeditions. At first, they were as dangerous as the early space flights of the 20th century. The time traveler said he had gone back to Machu Picchu in 1912. Some were skeptical. But in those early photographs taken by Hiram Bingham was the proof. Look closely, very closely, at those photographs taken in another century. You can understand now why they seem somehow familiar, like deja vu, because there, in some of the pictures, watching history unfold before him, is a traveler who had come much further than Bingham or any of his expedition party. He managed to get himself into a few of Bingham's pictures, proof that he had made his visit to a time before he was born. He is a man from 50 years in your future, visiting a hundred years in your past. Looking through those scrapbooks, we can wonder now how many of the people in the pictures might be from some other time. In so many old photos, the people seem just tourists peering into the camera. But perhaps they are really time travelers documenting their visits. It's often said that we learn from the past. True, but we also learn from the future. For it was on another expedition in time to Machu Picchu, to the year 1500, that a traveler from the future rediscovered Timentia. The Incas had found the magical substance high in the mountain jungles. And when they had to abandon Machu Picchu, they did so not by fleeing into those jungles, but rather by escaping into time. The traveler took a small amount of Timentia back to the future, where it was studied and more was sought out and found, which gave him the chance to go back in time and discover it to begin with. With time travel, whether the chicken or the egg came first, is not even a question. They both did. How do you define traveling? By where you go? By how you get there? Or by what you learn? How do you know how far someone has traveled? Or from when? Only time will tell. We know Richard gets around. Um, and we also know he has big balls. But, um, <laughs> Let me be serious for one moment. Um, in the early 70s, there was a rather fringe movement. It was called recycling. And uh, it started off as one of those sort of crunchy granola movements that eventually hit the mainstream, and now it's pretty much commonplace. We're looking at the same kind of thing with travel. Um, 
We have things called ecotourism and sustainable tourism and so forth. And I actually think it's much more than that. It's actually the future of travel. And just as I think one of the critical elements in moving recycling into the mainstream was our kids, I think that's actually going to be one of the major impetuses to make cherishing the places, preserving the places that we take for granted, that are very much a part of our, our cultural zeitgeist, it's going to be the kids. And so I just leave you with this thought. As we, we rush into this mad pell-mell um, embracement of, of great technology and new ideas, we should take a look at what we've already got. Because what is around us and the things that are special, that is the emotional content of our lives. And that emotional content is here for each of us today. But I think it's critical that we preserve it for the kids of tomorrow. Because I want my son, who's 13, to understand the joy of travel and the specialness of place. Thank you. And thank you, Richard. Thank you, Moses.